This video on the Psalms is going to be about lamentations. Now, lamentations are the most common form of Psalms. There are two types. Individual lamentation, when a person is telling God what is wrong, and then communal lamentations, when the affliction touches the entire community. In lamentations, there are a series of parts that we often find. First of all, the person calls upon God because the person trusts in God's intervention. Second, the person describes what's wrong. Now, sometimes that can be a very specific description that people are telling lies about me, that I have a serious illness and I'm dying, that the enemy are at the gates. But sometimes it's a very generic description that could be applied to almost any situation. There's a call for help, God, please do something. And as I said in a previous session, sometimes that call is rather forceful. The Jewish people have what's called chutzpah. It's a little bit of nerviness. There's a cute joke told about a lady who's at a seashore with her child, and a wave comes and pulls the child out. Well, she looks up at the heavens and says, God, this is my only child. Please bring him back. The next wave brings the child back, deposits the child right at her feet. She looks down, looks up at the heavens and says, he had a hat on. That sometimes in prayer, the Jewish people are a little bit forceful because they believe that God wants to hear what they really need. They don't want to surrender to God's will before they tell God what the situation really is. But the last part of almost every lamentation is a hymn of thanksgiving. In Hebrew, it's called a todah, that the person is so sure that God will intervene, that the person bursts out in joy. That's very, very important because one of the famous lamentations is Psalm 22. That's the Psalm that Jesus quoted on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When Jesus is on the cross, very few disciples stuck by him. And except for the Gospel of Luke in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus really hears nothing, especially in the Gospel of Mark. There's no response. Jesus, in his heart, knows that the Father is with him, but looking around, can't see it. He feels abandoned, and yet he wants to trust. It's very much like our faith. Sometimes we give with one hand, and we pull back with the other. Yes, God, I trust in you, but you better do this by 12 o'clock. That's almost what Jesus does on the cross. He expresses his feeling of being abandoned, but at the same time, at the end, there's a todah, a hymn of thanksgiving, because he knows God will rescue him. In fact, the letter to the Hebrew says that Jesus offered up his lamentation, his, his beseeching for help, and because of that, God delivered him. Not delivered him from the cross, delivered him in the resurrection. Now, as long as we're talking about Psalm 22, one other thing that we should take into consideration is the fact that Jesus quoting the first verse is really quoting the whole psalm. That includes the thanksgiving at the end, but it also includes the description of all his suffering. And when we hear Psalm 22 on Good Friday, it's remarkable because it seems almost as if the heavens are open and we received a very clear description of what was going to happen on Good Friday. It's very difficult for us to remember that that psalm was written hundreds of years before the crucifixion. It's very similar to the poems that we find in 2nd Isaiah, chapters 40 to 55, called the Songs of the Suffering Servant. There are four poems talking about a mysterious figure who dies for our sins, is buried among the poor, and is raised from the dead. When we read those during Holy Week and we think about Jesus, they fit perfectly even though those poems were written 700 years before the event. Most of the time when we have messianic prophecies, the Holy Spirit gives a hint, and then we see how it's fulfilled later on. With Psalm 22, with the songs of the suffering servant, the Holy Spirit is explicit, saying this is the way it is. Well, let's look at a couple of other psalms that are lamentations. In Psalm 13, we hear the following. How long, O Lord, will you forget me? How long will you hide your face? Hiding his face means that God is not only not answering, but actually running away from listening to this. 
How long must I bear grief in my soul, this sorrow in my heart day and night? There's never a time when I don't feel that sorrow. How long shall my enemy prevail? Remember, in Hebrew, saying something three times is already using the superlative. That's why when we at Mass we say, holy, 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 we're proclaiming that God is the holiest. By saying it four times, how long? The psalmist is saying, God, you are late. It's very much like Martha and Mary. Remember when they greeted Jesus at the gate to this, the town of Bethany when their brother had died? And they said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. What they were effectively saying is, Lord, you're late. You should have been here days ago. Now he's dead four days, irretrievably dead. Well, it's that same idea here. The psalmist is saying, I can't afford to wait any longer. Look at me, answer me, Lord my God. The call for intervention. Give light to my eyes, lest I fall asleep in death. God, you've got to do something quick, because I'm at the point of death. And remember in the Psalms, except for 49 and 73, there is no afterlife. The afterlife is very shadowy. It's called Sheol. Sheol is a place of shades where everybody goes, good, bad, and different. It's not a reward. It's not a punishment. It's simply where you end up. It's a holding tank. The only one who can rescue us from death is God. Lest my enemies say I have overcome him. Lest my foes rejoice at my downfall. So God, these are the reasons you have to intervene. Because if my enemies are able to say that they've overcome me, it's going to look bad for you. Notice that chutzpah again, telling God off, telling him that he better act quick. As for me, I trust in your, your merciful love. Notice the hymn of praise has begun. Let my heart rejoice in your saving help. Let me sing to the Lord for his goodness to me, singing psalms to the name of the Lord, the Most High. And so, as almost every lamentation, this psalm ends with a hymn of praise because the psalmist knows that God will intervene. Now, notice I said almost every lamentation. Psalm 88, the psalm that's used for night prayer on Friday is the one exception. There's no hymn of thanksgiving at the end. And somehow it's appropriate that on Friday, the day that we commemorate the crucifixion, there should be a psalm that is so negative. Now, there's a psalm that we've often used for the deceased. It's, it's a psalm that calls upon God in lamentation, again, asking for his intervention. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Now, out of the depths could have an ambiguous meaning. It could mean that I'm in the dumps, or the depths could almost be Sheol, that place where you go after death. It feels as if I'm already dead, God. It feels as if there's nothing left. Lord, hear my prayer. Oh, let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleading. Notice the parallelism, saying the same thing twice. If you, O oh Lord, should mark our guilt, Lord, who would survive? One of the common elements of many of the lamentations is the recognition that maybe we deserve this. Maybe God is punishing us for our sins, and our sins are serious enough that we deserve to be punished. But God, I'm at the point of death. If you continue this punishment, I'm not going to make it. So you've got to intervene. But with you is found forgiveness. For this, we revere you. The mercy of God is the greatest sign of God's omnipotence. The omnipotence of God is not measured by the fact that he can create a universe and destroy it. It's measured by the fact that even when we turn away from him, he still loves us. My soul is waiting for the Lord. I count on his word. My soul is longing for the Lord more than watchmen for daybreak. Let the watchmen count on daybreak and Israel on the Lord, because with the Lord there is mercy and fullness of redemption. Notice that idea of the thanksgiving. Israel, indeed, he will redeem from all its iniquity. So even if we're being punished, even if we deserve this difficult time that we're going through, God will intervene because God is so much greater than our sinfulness. That's a lesson that's so important to remember. The mercy of God is always greater than our sinfulness. Sometimes when I'm in the confessional, people will tell me, Father, I've confessed this sin over and over again. It's not that I've done it over and over again. I just don't feel I'm forgiven. That's what we call the sin against the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the love between the Father and the Son and their love for us. 
And the sin against the Holy Spirit is to believe that my sin, my guilt, is more powerful than God's love. I won't accept that forgiveness. And why is this sin against the Holy Spirit unforgivable? Because I won't accept the forgiveness God's offering. Problem is not God not being willing to forgive. The problem is me not being willing to accept that forgiveness. And how do I finally accept that forgiveness? I surrender to God's love. I recognize that I'm not in charge. God is. Now let's look at two Psalms that actually form one idea. Psalm 42, Psalm 43. 42 and 43 probably were originally one Psalm, but over the years they became separated. How do we know they're one Psalm? Because three times in these two Psalms, we hear the expression, why are you cast down my soul, why groan within me? Hope in God, I will praise him still, my Savior and my God. Now that's found in the middle of Psalm 42, at the end of Psalm 42, at the end of Psalm 43. So it serves as a type of antiphon, calling it back. There are three main sections to this Psalm, the beginning of Psalm 42, the end of Psalm 42, and then Psalm 43. And the beginning of Psalm 42 talks about the past, how in the past we saw the presence of God. This, the author of this Psalm is probably a Levite, talks about walking in the procession with the community, and now he feels as if he's abandoned. He talks about the fact that he's like a deer that yearns for running streams. Picture a land that's very dry. There's no running water. And the deer is, is desperately pawing at the ground in a dried out riverbed looking for some moisture. That's what we feel like. We're thirsting for God. And what, what relief do we receive? My tears are my bread day and night. The only water that I receive are my tears. I feel so abandoned. I feel as if I'm cast down and abandoned. I have no hope. The second part of Psalm 42 talks about the present more. And it speaks about how he, he's caught up in a rapids. I asked for water. What do I get? A rapids. I'm, I'm drowning in this. And everybody's mocking me. Where's your God now? He feels terrible. Now, why is the Levite feeling this way? Because he's being carried away into exile. He lived his entire life around Jerusalem. That worship in the temple was his entire life. And now he's being dragged away, probably into Babylon. He speaks about being near the country of Jordan and Mount Hermon, the hill of Misar. That's in the north of Israel. He's being taken away. He feels downcast. But Psalm 43 reverses that whole idea. It speaks about the fact that God will in fact intervene. That he doesn't have to worry again because God will come to his rescue. And he's filled with a sense of joy. So by the end of Psalm 43, when he says, why are you downcast, my soul? It's almost something that's forgotten. That why are you still sad? Because God will come to my help. Now, one of the things about the Psalms is that they're always filled with a lot of symbolism. We see the symbolism of thirsting, the symbolism of tears for water, the symbolism of being caught up in a rapids. But one of the greatest symbolisms in this psalm is the number of times that God's name is mentioned. In the first part of the psalm that talks about the past, God's name is mentioned eight times. Remember, the perfect number is seven. So eight means God was super present, always present. In the Psalm 43, the third part, the future, God's name is mentioned eight times. But in the central part, the second part of Psalm 42, God's name is mentioned six times. Six, one short of seven. He feels the absence. He feels as if God's not around. And isn't that what often happens in our spiritual life? When we look back in the past, we can see God's fingerprints all over what happened. When we look to the future, we can hope that God will make it right again. But in the present, we often feel as if God's not around. We don't, we don't know where to turn for him. We don't even know how to pray. It reminds me a lot of when Moses wanted to see God's face, and God told him to hide his face in the ground, and only when he passed by could he look up 
and see the presence of God. That very often in the present, we're looking down at the ground. We're, we're caught up in our earthly things. But when, the, when these things are resolved, when we're looking into the past, we can see God's presence all over the place. And that gives us hope for the future again. Because as God rescued us in the past, he's going to rescue us in the future. Now, one thing to be careful of, when I say he rescues us, I'm not saying he makes it all better. God is not a magician who waves a magic wand and everything's fine. We win the lottery, we find a job, we, we find the right spouse, etc. God doesn't always make it all better, but he makes all the difference. Because we realize even in those times that we don't see his presence, he was there. His, his absence was not the fact that he was away. It's the fact that we had gotten so preoccupied with our problems, we forgot to look for him. He will be there. He's always there. And may God bless us.